Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I hold the keys of hell and death. Because I live, you shall live also. Friends, we have gathered here to praise God and to witness to our faith as we celebrate the life of Patricia Stroman. We come together in grief, acknowledging our human loss. May God grant us grace that in pain we may find comfort, in sorrow, hope, and in death, resurrection. Let us pray. O oh God who gave us birth, you're ever more ready to hear than we are to pray. You know our needs before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Give to us now your grace that as we shrink before the mystery of death, we may see the light of eternity. Speak to us once more your solemn message of life and of death. Help us to live as those who are prepared to die, and when our days here are accomplished, enable us to die as those who go forth to live, so that living or dying, our life may be in you, and that nothing in life or in death will be able to separate us from your great love. In Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. I come to the garden alone while the dew They're singing, and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells Tell me I am his own. 
Patricia Ann Hutcherson Stroman passed on to her heavenly home on Sunday, June 5th, 2022. Patricia was born September 19th, 1938 in Poto, Oklahoma to Earl and Aileen Hutcherson. During her childhood, she lived in New Orleans, Houston, and finally Lubbock. She graduated from Lubbock High School, and upon graduation, she attended Texas Tech University. While attending Texas Tech, Patricia met James Patrick Pat Stroman. They married in February of 1958 and moved to Beaumont, where their first child, Johanna, was born. In 1960, the Pats moved to Waco. In the coming years, they were blessed with two additional daughters, Cheryl and Stacy, to complete their family. As an active member and leader at St. John's United Methodist Church, now Central United Methodist Church, Patricia loved being part of the choir, as well as coordinating and teaching Vacation Bible School over many years. Patricia, as one of the Pats, initiated a Sunday school class for college students, bringing fellowship, worship, and leadership to their young adults in the community. She and Pat also served on the welcome committee each Sunday. If the doors of the church were open, they were there serving together. Patricia's devotion to the Methodist Church provided her an opportunity to work as the executive assistant to the district superintendent of the United Methodist District Office for tw over 20 years. Patricia was a loving wife, mother, sister, and Meemaw. Not only did she adore her grandchildren and great-grandchildren, her grandchildren and great-grandchildren adored their Meemaw. Patricia was preceded in death by her husband, James Patrick, her parents, brothers Earl Hutcherson Jr. and James Hutcherson and sister, and sister Marsha Lee Hutcherson. She is survived by her daughters, Johanna Nystrom and husband Greg of Dallas, Cheryl Roberts and husband Wes of Hewitt, and Stacy Erb and husband Troy of Austin. Seven grandchildren, Ryan Nystrom and wife Erin of Frisco, Whitney Nystrom of Dallas, Bobby Martin of Savannah, Georgia, Patrick Martin of Mount Pleasant, Marissa Yoakum and husband Tanner of Glen Rose, and Drew and Jake Erb of Los Angeles, California. Six great-grandchildren, Lucy, Graham, and Jack Nystrom of Frisco, Aubrey Rose Martin of Savannah, Georgia, Turner and Tegan Yoakum of Glen Rose, J.W. Hutcherson of Sanger, and many nieces and nephews. The family would like to thank the caregivers at St. Anthony's Care Center, Blue Bonnet Hospice, and Hardis Waco for their compassionate care of their mother. The family also extends gratitude to Sherry Byers for her unwavering friendship and visits to their mother. This time I'd like to welcome Mr. Hutcherson, Pat's brother, to come forward. Well, for those folks that know me and to see me walk up without any notes, I'm sure they're concerned about the time I'm going to take up here. Um, golly, uh, those are good things to hear about my little sister. And, uh, uh, and all so true, all so true. I was thinking that if there were a person who had the capability as well as the desire to create a perfect little sister for someone, uh, I would suggest they use my little sister for the model. Uh, great girl, great girl. Um, I think every brother should have a little sister 
like Patricia, especially if the big brother tended to push the envelope a bit from time to time. Uh, I have friends from Lubbock sitting right here in front that know what, they're, what I'm talking about, I think. I, I was the one in our family of five uh, children that if the envelope was going to be pushed, it would be me pushing it. And uh, I don't know uh, how many times that I needed some protection uh, because of something that I'd gotten into and shouldn't have. And if Patricia knew about it, and often she did, uh, she had my back. And uh, now I'm not going to tell you that I went out and robbed anything, okay? But, uh, but uh, I did seem to get in uh, hot water from time to time, and, and I could always count on Trish uh, keeping things to ourselves. So I have a very special feeling about her in that particular way. I thought I might, um, it, it mentioned in, in the obituary that was written here that uh, uh, Trish lived in, uh, uh, after being born in Poto, Oklahoma, over in eastern Oklahoma. Um, uh, it mentioned that she lived in New Orleans, Houston, and finally in Lubbock. Um, our father was uh, working in the oil fields uh, early in, in our childhood, and uh, we did move a great deal. And uh, I, I'm not sure, but I think uh, Patricia, while she, was, while she lacked one day being three years younger than me, uh, the other sister that was mentioned in here uh, was born prior to my arrival on the good earth. Um, she was born also on Patricia's birthday. So mom and dad had a lot of birthdays all at once there, and, and uh, we seemed to celebrate them all at one time. Uh, Marsha Lee passed away uh, uh, because of an accident prior to my birth. And so Patricia had dad's eye, and uh, she took advantage of it every time she could, too, let me tell you. Anyway, I, I shared with Joanna on the phone the other day that dad's got his little girl back with him now, and, uh, and that's such a special thing to feel in one's heart. And I feel that as strongly as I can feel I'm standing here, so. So Trisha's got, got dad with her again. I want to uh, mention to you just one other thing. We were in New Orleans when World War II started, and my dad worked out in the, in the swamps area with Gulf Oil Company, so we did not get to see dad but about once a month, and then only for maybe a long weekend at best. Um, I, I don't remember exactly how many rooms were in this upstairs apartment that uh, uh, friends owned and we lived in, but uh, probably not more than about three, if, the, if I remember correctly. A kitchen, a bedroom, a bath, and, and somewhere to eat. And uh, when we moved to Houston, um, we had... Uh, uh, another apartment, if you could find anything to live in during those years, because they were scarce. We only had two bedrooms. Now, when we finally, after that year, got to Lubbock, uh, I believe after renting a house for a couple of years, we finally had our first house that we owned and felt was ours, and settled down there and remained the rest of our our uh, childhood lives. Uh, what I wanted to say is that the year um, from September 1st of 1948 until June 1st of 1949 was an epic year in the life of Patricia and me. Now, the reason for that is that my big brother, Earl, received a scholarship to participate on the track team at Oklahoma 
uh, Oklahoma A&M in those years, right, Oklahoma State today, received a scholarship to Oklahoma A&M and uh, about uh, just before the 1st of September left and went to Stillwater. Now, for the first time in Patricia's and my life, living together, we had our own bedroom. <laughs> Trisha and I had to be good friends because we shared a bedroom until that year, everywhere we lived. And uh, now, the other epic occurrence was that my brother Earl got homesick and decided to come back home, go to school at Texas Tech. So guess who was living together again in the bedroom? Oh, I don't know when he was finally got, finished college and went off the Air Force, but uh, we finally got, his, uh, got our bedroom back. And uh, anyway, it was, uh, that, that, that was a horrible thing for her to have to live with a big brother. <laughs> Same room. Trish was absolutely wonderful. And uh, uh, she left uh, a, a wonderful family. Uh, in my opinion, uh, one of them's a little testy. Uh, yeah, <laughs> she's over there. <laughs> but uh, a great family that she loved dearly, and uh, Trish was a good sister, a good daughter. She was a good mom, a great mom, a great grandma, and I expect a great aunt, and and everything else that goes along with those things, and. I'll dearly miss my little sister, but uh, take great comfort in knowing that she's where she needs to be, wants to be, and uh, has had a great reunion with mom and dad. Thank you. Some of the members of Miss Pat's family wanted to share some thoughts and some words with you all and they had written them down and asked us to read some of those and so I'd like to do that at this time. This is from Marissa Yoakum. There are no right words to accurately describe what my Mima means to me. It is more of a mixture of feelings and I can still feel every experience I had with her always peaceful, happy, and fun. I spent the night with my Mima and Peepaw a lot. Each time, morning started with me sitting at the kitchen table telling my Mima what shape I wanted my pancakes to be. It didn't matter what I asked for, she would try her best and my Peepaw would come in and to tease her about how they didn't look right she would tell him to come do better then. He tried a few times, but hers were always better. He always asked for his to be silver dollars. Plain buttermilk pancakes have never tasted as good anywhere else. She would let me talk about anything and these conversations would start in one place and end somewhere totally different. We had a lot of conversations in the mornings or during my peepaw's mandatory naps. She would uh, tell me about her childhood, jobs she had, meeting peepaw, and shared many stories about my mom and her sisters. As shy as I was, I don't think anyone ever believed them when, I, when they said I would talk their ears off. What I have realized now is that they realized just they, they really just let me be myself. I was a very active girl, thanks to my two big brothers, and didn't always want to do typical girl things. I am sure I wore my Mima out with my ideas, but it didn't matter. She was always up for anything. My peepaw always got a nap in, and she would stay up to entertain me. She never made me take one uh, made, made me take one, but I'm sure she was happy when I did. I would come up with plans for when people woke up and they never involved staying inside. I'm so thankful for all the memories at the park, walking through trails, 
going to the basketball courts, the skate park, building things in Peepaw's shop, playing games in the backyard, playing with Lou, walks through their neighborhood, the movies, and so many more things they did just to spend time with me. My Mima is the most classy, sweetest woman that I've ever known. She was also very strong. She had her own opinions and didn't mind being stern if needed. She put up with my Peepaw's teasing, but was certainly no pushover to him. She was so humble. She would never admit, admit to being good at much, but she was so good at so many things. The most important, being a faithful, active servant of God. She had mastered being a good person. I will never forget her smooches, as she called them, and the way they always made the smooch sound. She was the perfect Mima. There are a lot of simple things in life that I can't do or see without thinking of my Mima or Peepa. Every time I make scrambled eggs, I think of my Mima. She taught me how to make them, which was clearly a very important life lesson. I can't wrap a present without thinking about the tricks she showed me or Peepa coming in to ask why we don't just use duct tape. She taught me how to uh, make homemade Rice Krispie treats, and the, package, and, to, and the package ones never do taste the same. She always let me lick the batter off the whisk when baking, or just straight out of the mixing bowl. I will never be able to see a pecan without thinking of them, although I can't say I will eat any for them. Big white Ford pickup trucks with, will forever make me think of my peepaw and the step stool he would bring out for my Mima to get in. When I think of communion, I can't help but think of the time spent in the afternoons after church, helping Mima clean up all the little cups and washing dishes. I think of Jesus too, of course. But that's fitting because I really can't pray, walk into a church, or help someone without thinking of them at some point. My Mima and Peepaw supported me throughout my entire education and athletic events. It didn't matter what it was. They didn't miss much. Their hugs, support, and pride they showed made me feel so loved. They did this for everyone and had a way of making every person they loved feel so special. It's hard to talk about one pat without talking about the other. Mima and Peepaw have the perfect ring to it. They had the most beautiful marriage and friendship that I've, uh, that I've witnessed. I believe my Peepaw was there to take her hand as she entered God's kingdom, and she deserves every bit of it. I have shed many tears knowing my time with them on earth is now over. But there has also been many, many happy tears for my Mima, for both of them. They are together again forever, and that makes my world seem right again. To my mom, Aunt Joanna, and Aunt Stacy, your parents built such a successful, well-rounded family. Of course, I might be a little biased, but I would say they had a 100% success rate. I have no doubt that it started with their parents and it could not have been continued without the great qualities each of you po passes, poses, uh, possess that Meemaw and Peepaw instilled in each of you. I know they are looking down and are so proud of the three of you. They can truly rest in peace together. From Robert Martin, Meemaw. It's nearly impossible to encapsulate your, your, meanings to, your meaning to me and the remarkable life you've lived in only a few words. To be honest, I'm not sure if there is enough paper on this planet to describe how much we all love you and just what you've meant to me, our family and many others that had had the privilege to know you. I'll start by congratulating you on such a wonderful life lived. I know without a doubt and find comfort that you are exactly where you need to be. You have earned it. I'd imagine heaven is running a whole lot smoother with someone to tell Peepaw what to do. 
You have always been there for us without question, judgment, or hesitation. You've been strong when we felt weak. You've been steady when we felt weary. You've guided us when we've gotten lost. I remember always looking forward to my birthday each year and getting to go with Meemaw and Peepaw to Doc's Riverfront and shopping. We would be there for hours feeding the ducks and talking. However, it never quite felt long enough. You have been a full-time Meemaw, and I know everyone that is lucky enough to call you that agrees. You have been there for games, ceremonies, graduations, weddings, deployments, and anything you thought someone needed their Mima. When someone needed their Mima, you always knew. I will forever be grateful for having the honor to be your grandson, and I know you will always live in my heart. I love you. And from Patrick, Mima. There has been one conversation with you and Peepa that I have always gone back and thought upon throughout these last several years. I look forward to all of the times that we would spend together. However, for some reason, the thought of having this conversation made me strangely nervous. Oh, I was excited to tell you all about the mission trip that I had just come back from, but there was one question I decided to ask you both that I just didn't know what your answer would be, even though I very well should have. I wanted to know what you thought about me being a Baptist. <laughs> Mima, both parts of your answer have, have been seared into my mind. To my surprise, you told me that you used to be a Baptist before you met Peepaw. You said that any conflict there could have been could have been went out the window when you realized that becoming a Methodist meant that you, that you got to dance. <laughs> While I always laughed and told people that story, it is what you said next that has become inspirational to me. When you spoke to your mother about becoming a Methodist, you told me that her words were, whatever you are going to be, be it well. That was the same message that you passed along to me that day. The charge to be like Christ is to, be, is, to do, is to the best of our ability. The inspiration for steadfastness, whatever God has called you to serve. Growing up, I knew the difference that you made in my life. Every birthday, I look forward to that birthday dinner that all of us grandchildren got to have with you and people. I always knew who was going to pick me up from school on that day, you. There was never a doubt, never wondering if you would really show up. You showed up every single time. You showed up for much more than that. Mima, you were so many things to so many people. I knew how special you were to me. But year after year, I felt as if I was uncovering just how much of a difference you made in the lives of others. In a world where unwavering commitment can be hard to come by, you seemed to always show up and do what you were called to do. You were a loving wife for 60 years. You were a strong mother. You were a compassionate grandmother. You were faithful to your church, not just in attendance, but in service. You were sacrificial in your time spent reaching students for Christ. You were the friend that so many people around you needed. You were the best at making fun-shaped pancakes. Of course, that made them taste that much better. I know that your hope would be for us all to receive the free gift of life that Christ alone offers to that we, we too could live with such purpose and, and hope. As much as it hurts for the, same be for the time being, we take great joy knowing that you and Peepaw are together again. I love you, Meemaw, and I look forward to that day when we can all see you both again. There were so many things that you were and still are to so many people. Meemaw, for everything that you were, you did it well. And there were just a few notes 
from the great-grandchildren that I want to share very quickly. Dear Nana, I'm so sorry that your mom and dad are both in heaven, but I'm sure that Peepaw is hugging her tight now. Love, Lucy. This is from Jack. I remember Mima hugging me. From Graham. I remember decorating a cake with jelly beans when we visited her at her home. And again from Lucy. I remember she had a pet named B. She bought us jelly beans every time we came. She also bought pickles every time we visited. Love, Lucy. <clears throat> Kids have a way of putting it really well and specific. Jelly beans, pickles, hugs and pancakes and um, it's part of my message towards the end here. We'll uh, share a letter uh, from Cheryl that was written to Pat, and I'll share that here in a little bit. I was a, a pastor at Central uh, for six years and got to know uh, both the Pats very well, and uh, it was a privilege to serve there as their pastor, and so many are here today uh, from the church, and not just from Central, but from the merger itself, which is neat to kind of Think about what it took to bring churches and people together, but that's who they were, who they were, uh, bringing people together. Uh, family said uh, Joshua 24 passage would be good to share with you, and uh, you'll, uh, many of you will find this um, scripture one that you've heard before. Uh, this is uh, Joshua. They uh, entered the promised land, and here's. Here's what Joshua said to the people. Now, therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, if you're unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, help us to hear a word of hope and grace and love, what you say to us and through us. And may it make a real difference in the way that we treat others, and especially as we remember and celebrate Pat. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, one of the best things about being a United Methodist pastor is you get to move around a lot. And everybody laughs when you say that because they're like, oh, it'd be terrible. You know, they send you a preacher and then they pull them and, you know, blah, blah, on back and forth. But from the pastor's perspective and one who's traveled around, you have no idea the impact that the churches and you make on us. You are our pastors in a way. Uh, it's true of every church I've been in. I look back, and I can say now, very soon, uh, I could literally go up I-35 from Round Rock to Waco to Arlington and have family. I mean, I can get a free meal anywhere. I could just pop in anywhere. And Pat and Pat became family to us. Our boys were 10 and 7 when we moved to Waco, and they just spoiled them. Uh, when the boys would come into church, into the narthex, they'd have the donut holes, you know, the donuts. And they'd have the cups full of donut holes. Mom would say, that's enough, and then Pat would say, oh, they're fine. Uh, I loved her sense of humor. Uh, one of the first times I visited them at their home, I was telling them a story. I was serving in Tawakana, which is near Mahia, if that helps. And we were uh, doing a nursing home service. It was once a month. And the music people who were supposed to lead for that day were not able to make it. So I got up in front of the room full of residents and their family, and I said, I'm going to lead this, but I, I can't sing. And a lady on the very front, resident of the nursing home, said, oh, son, it'll be fine. Just make a joyful noise. It'll be fine. So I lead the group, 
in Blessed Assurance, it was one of the worst renditions of Blessed Assurance in the history of Christendom. Then at the end of the hymn, the same lady on the front says for everyone to hear, Dang, boy, you were right. <laughs> so I, I told Pat and Pat that story in their home. The next Sunday, the first hymn, Blessed Assurance. So everybody stands to sing, so I'm standing up there, and Pat's in the choir. Mr. Pat's in the back at the soundboard. He's grinning from ear to ear. And I look back, and she gives me this wink like it was hilarious. She loved it. But they had that about them. Uh, the way they, they, they welcomed people, and you mentioned how uh, she moved around a lot when she was younger. I find that people who move around a lot tend to welcome people fairly well because they know what it's like to be new. And, and they did that in the, in the church. Uh, especially with the college students. They had a wonderful connection with the college students. I would go over to some of the meals that they would share, and they'd have the students over to the house uh, and just love to do that. But what sticks out most to me is the way they served and they saw beyond their local church. One of the best things about the United Methodist Church is it is a connection, and we see, hopefully, bigger than our own local setting, and not just the United Methodist Church, but the church at large, the church universal, and they could see that, and they gave a lot of their life to serving beyond just the local church. Um, we have what's called annual conference in the United Methodist Church, and uh, each year, the delegates from the church, the lay delegates, would go with the pastor. And so uh, this one particular conference, I remember, Pat and Pat were there, of course, and we went to lunch during the break. And I knew that after the break, they were both going to receive an award together, you know, recognizing them for all of their years of service. Now, I was one that didn't get too particularly excited about annual conference. Uh, you know, if you've seen paint dry, you've seen annual conference sometimes it can get a little so much to their surprise at lunch I, I knew we had to be back by a certain time I said I'll go pick up the car and I'll pick you up here if y'all want to get the check and they were like this is odd why is he wanting to get back there he's never been well we finally get back to the church and it just surprised them and you know Pat she did not want to be recognized as and they were just grinning from ear to ear when they were recognized for all that they've done in the church. Uh, when she came back from getting the award, she looked at me and said, now I know why you were in such a hurry. <laughs> but it's a privilege uh, to have known them both and to serve. And I think, um, Cheryl, uh, what you've written for your mom uh, is, is a beautiful thing, and I'd like to, to share that. Hi, Mother, I know you're not surprised that I'm not up here reading this. You deserve to be honored today and every day forward. I was afraid I would just remember you the way you have been the past couple of years, but when I picture you, it's the way you always were, perfectly dressed from head to toe and happy. You told me recently that I bet I never thought I would have to do the things for my own mother that I was doing. I hope you believe me when I said it was an honor and a payback for all you had done for us. Your favorite thing was to be a Meemaw. The interest you took in all your grandkids and great-grandkids was heartfelt. I don't remember too many football, baseball, or basketball games, whether in or out of town, that you and Daddy weren't there wearing your China Spring shirts. You told me that Daddy once got thrown out of a Texas Tech basketball game for getting too excited which is why I wasn't surprised when he started yelling air ball at one of Bobby's games. <laughs> Luckily, only once, and he got to stay. I know that my kids always felt free to confide in you and get your advice. You love telling stories about all of your grandkids and the funny things they said to you, like when Bobby was very young and spent the night with you at Meemaw's, and he told you the next morning you had the worst breath he had ever smelled. You like that one, that's good, yeah. 
I remember you kept us out of trouble with Daddy the time we weren't supposed to be riding up and down Valley Mills Drive, and you caught us. Luckily, he was out of town. I remember your cooking, which is probably why I only like things cooked your way. And I remember when I suddenly wanted to move to Lubbock and neither you or Daddy told me what a bad idea it was and didn't hold it over my head when I begged to come back. You even gave me gas money. I remember you holding down the fort down when Daddy worked out of town every other week. Most of all, I remember how you never spent any time on yourself except maybe reading or making your weekly trip to the beauty shop every Friday. You were always planning on what you needed to do at church or for someone else, and I never heard you complain about anything. I never heard you say a bad word about anyone, and you used your time to serve others, including other people's kids. And what gave me comfort from the minute I watched you take your last breath? It was the faith you had which gave you your acceptance. About a year ago, when you had to be revived from death, you asked us why we didn't just let you go. In fact, I hear that you told others about it. I told you it just didn't seem like the thing to do, but from that day forward, I knew that when you went, I would let you go. Stacy and Joanna felt, felt the same way and asked you what it was like when you died, and you said it was wonderful. Nothing hurt, and no one was asking you to move. Mother, we will miss you but we aren't mourning you because we know for sure you are happier and more healthy than you have been in a long time. I know you are so happy that Daddy is there with you, and I know he's been watching over you and was ready for you when you got there. I will see you soon. Love, Cheryl. Hear these words from Paul in Romans. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Pat believed that and lived it, and we celebrate that today. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks today for jelly beans and pancakes and hugs, pickles. We thank you for a loving spirit that welcomed others and encouraged unity. And today we lift up this family that they may know your comfort in a special way and to know that one day we will all be united together again with you just as Pat and Pat are in this very moment. And so we give her to you, knowing that that is enough to trust in your grace and your mercy. And we pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen.
shalt be safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. When with and that and thousand years, bright And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>